Hello, welcome everyone. Um, we've got a lot of people with us tonight. We've got a terrific panel. This is going to be a stimulating, meaningful conversation that's going to stick with all of us for a long time. I can guarantee that. Um, we've got a number of students here at the positive psychology class at the University of Northern Iowa. We have a bunch of people joining us online on Zoom. And as I said, we've got this terrific panel. So just quickly to situate what we're doing. Um, this is a course called Foundations of Positive Psychology. It's an undergraduate um, course here at the University of Northern Iowa. And within positive psychology, there's been a movement about the last 20 years, a subfield called positive education, which applies principles and research from the field of positive psychology, which is oftentimes described as the study of what makes life good um, to education. And there are a number of schools that have applied principles of positive psychology, not so much in the US, but certainly in other parts of the country. Australia in particular has a lot of schools who are applying positive psychology. Um, in parallel to that, for the last 15, 20 years, there's been a movement called um, learner-centered education. You know, a lot of the students in the class were not familiar with that until they started reading about it just over the last few days. But schools that practice, and there are a number of them, and they take different approaches that apply learner-centered ed education are essentially doing intuitively what schools that are applying principles of positive psychology do more um, deliberately. So I've invited here a great panel. We've got a couple people representing Iowa Big, Hannah Bertram, a recent graduate and Chuck Peters, and we've got a couple of uh, terrific representatives from Springhouse in Virginia, and I will let them quickly introduce themselves. You wanna tell us who you are, Chuck? Okay, yeah, uh, Chuck Peters. Um, I lived in Iowa for a long time and was active in, uh, in a media company, but have devoted my last five years or six years to education and uh, was very active uh, in the founding of Iowa Big and am currently on the board at Springhouse. Anna? Hi, I'm Hannah Bertram. Gary called me a recent graduate, but I'm actually a soon to be graduate at UNI. I'm currently student teaching, got two weeks left, um, but I am an alumni of Iowa Big. When I was at Iowa Big, I worked on projects in education, but also mental health and food security. Uh, Jenny? Hi, everybody. My name is Jenny Finn, and I am the head of school and one of the founders at Springhouse. We're located in Floyd, Virginia, in the Blue Ridge Mountains, and we have a vision of building regenerative culture through vitality centered education. I'll pass it over to Skylar Locke, one of the most creative people I know. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Skylar. Uh, I am a senior at uh, Spring House. Um, yeah, I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you all. This is going to be terrific. So um, I will ask each of the panelists to talk a bit more about their experiences um, with, within learner-centered education. But we will within about 30 minutes or so, I think it'll probably take about that long, um, open it up for questions. So students in the class, if any of you would like to come up and ask questions, you uh, can certainly do that. And any of you who are joining us on Zoom, certainly let us know, just raise your hand one way or the other, and uh, or you can submit your question in the, um, in the chat if you like. So thank you very much. This is gonna be great. We will plan to go until uh, for an hour and a half, potentially, at a, from the start time. So I don't know if we'll go quite that long, but let's plan on that. And I don't think we're going to have a problem filling that space. Um, Chuck, you were instrumental. You don't take as much credit as you should, I know, but I will say that you were instrumental in um, the development of Iowa Big. Can you give us you know, the story of the genesis of Iowa Big and um, how it's evolved over the last few years? Yeah. Um, I'll try. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to. And I'll try to be give you the cartoon version of this. Uh, as I said, I was um, responsible uh, for the local media company in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, uh, the Gazette Company, which had a newspaper that was the dominant newspaper in Eastern Iowa, the Gazette, and had a television station, KCRG TV Nine. And in two thousand and eight. Uh, we had the fourth worst public disaster in U.S. history, a 
raging flood that destroyed the center of town. And we were strongly encouraged to live into a more life-giving and sustainable narrative. And okay, how would we do that as a media company? We were really wrestling with that because that's not traditionally been the role of a media company. And we decided, not, I didn't decide this, but other people convinced me that we should focus on education. And we decided to do that. And um, we were trying to get good stories about education when we found that we thought our governmental leaders were doing the exact opposite of what you would think should be done. And so um, we weren't getting to the core of those issues by our traditional reporting. So uh, Trace Pickering, who was the head of innovation at the Grant Wood Area Education Agency, said he had some ideas to share, uh, which he shared with me. And I said, well, you need to be our first community builder and come and work with us on being able to tell better stories to the community about these educational issues. And um, we found it extraordinarily hard to get these concepts when you have a basically a compliance driven system to known objectives to open up to creativity, collaboration, living into a new narrative. And so we were wrestling with that and uh, Trace Pickering uh, had one of his acquaintances, Sean Cornelli was a physics teacher in a local school. And they said, you know, we should try something. Let's get a diagonal cross section of people through the community who are thriving, you know, in, in whatever, what the, whatever they're doing, whether they're, a, you know, a fireman or a nurse or a teacher or a business person or a doctor, whatever they are, let's try to get, uh, you know, few dozen of those people together and get them in the room and describe what allows them to be successful every day. So they listed all of those factors, got that captured. Then they went to high school for a day as a student and they came back in the room. What did you observe? we are enculturating the exact opposite of the factors that lead to success. So how would we try to address that? And it was Trace and Sean who, who started the beginning process of, let's get the student to really connect with their authentic passion. Imagine a project that could help the community in line with that passion help them learn their subject matter through pursuing that passion. Those were the basic ideas. And so we developed that as a media company and we're planning to start our, a school ourselves uh, when the school district heard about it and said, rather than you guys doing it, why don't you license us the intellectual property? And that's how it started. So uh, Trace and Sean were the, first people and doing the work there, leading the school. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the Genesis story. We'll be happy to answer whatever questions you might have. Thanks, Chuck, that was great. Anna, can you um, speak to your experience at Iowa Big? And yeah. I think, well, and in addition to doing that, or while you're doing that, um, the students here in the class, they're reasonably up to speed on what Iowa Big is about, but not everybody who's joining us is. So if you can work that into your- Give yeah, um, the, the elevator pitch, the Iowa Big elevator pitch. That's fine too. Okay. <laughs> so um, Chuck, you did a really great job telling that origin story because it's so exciting. And I think what makes it really special is when the school district steps in and it's like, hey, there's value to this. There's educational value to what you are doing. Um, and that is totally what my experience was too. I think in the first year, Iowa Big, Chuck, correct me if I'm wrong. The first year of Iowa Big was like 12 students, something like that, really small group. 
Um, when I started, they were in year three or four. So we had a lot more students. Now, since I've graduated high school and senior in college, they have two separate locations. Um, tons of students, not just in Cedar Rapids, but Marion, Mount Vernon, um, super widespread coverage. But um, my experience, I really, I just, I loved it. Some of the projects I was involved in when I was there were ACEs, which I think you talk a little bit about in the positive psychology class, um, the adverse childhood experiences research, um, all about trauma informed um, approaches to pretty much anything, especially education. So um, that one was one I was involved in, really enjoyed that. Um, and then my senior year took on a project with um, another guy, um, called Ed Revision, and we partnered with Education Reimagined, which is an organization that uh, myself, Jenny, we're all involved in, um, which is kind of like a network of schools who are doing things differently, like Iowa Big was doing. Um, and then I was also involved in a project called the Food Environment Alliance, which in a nutshell, just tried to kind of connect all the different organizations in the Cedar Rapids area who were doing work to support people experiencing food insecurity. Um, but the overarching thing that made this stuff really special, like I'm, I'm not working in food insecurity now, I'm not working in mental health now, um, but what made it meaningful for me was the fact that it was real. Um, I think as somebody who's decided to go into education now, there's always a big push to making things um, authentic for students, right? Like how do you make them feel like they're doing the real world stuff? Um, but Iowa Big actually makes you do the real world stuff, which is why it was so special and meaningful for me. Um, yeah. Can you talk, Hannah, a bit about the nature of these? You use the term projects. Mm -hmm. So for those who don't know, can you talk about the nature of these projects, yeah. the, the scope so, of them and the purpose and how that yeah. works? You could almost think of it like if you're thinking from like your traditional high school experience, you could think of it like a project as a class in a sense. Um, but instead of you being told what classes you need to take, you're choosing what projects you want to be on based on your own interests. Um, so basically when they get you into Iowa Big, they ask you, well, what, what are you really interested in? Or what makes you angry about your community or your world or your state? Um, and then they find a way for you to get involved in actively making a change with that. So for example, um, the ACES project, that stemmed from a group of us who were really passionate about mental health and how it how it was responded to in schools. So our focus was very school-based, but this connected to all types of different things you'd be doing in regular classes. I mean, as far as like language goes, um, public speaking, we were writing a ton, reading a ton of research on mental health, especially like the ACEs research. Um, and then you think about like the science behind that, the psychology behind that. Um, so what our teachers would do is find ways to connect what we were doing in that project with actual Iowa core standards. And that might not be a term you're familiar with if you're not an education major, but um, basically in Iowa schools, everything has to be connected to some sort of standard. So instead of it being like, you're gonna take this class, you're gonna achieve this standard. It was more like, you're gonna do a project that you're interested in. We're gonna figure out what standards we can tie it to along the way. And ultimately everybody learns stuff, so. That's kind of the concept of the projects. And then for that project and your other project, if you want to speak to that, what were some of the outcomes? What were some of the deliverables mm. from your from your team? I think the one I look back on and I'm most excited about would probably be um, the things that came out of Ed Revision um, because it's an ongoing project still. It's a project that kind of exists to help Iowa Big network with other schools like Iowa Big. Um, and then they continue to have that partnership with Education Reimagined, participating in conferences with them, doing writing for them. Um, that's a really neat outcome that, that, that that's still going on. Um, but like more on a smaller scale, 
looking at like the Food Environment Alliance, we helped create a website for the Food Environment Alliance to actually create a space for these people to regularly collaborate, you know, making sure they have like a consistent setup meeting. Like those are little small things that um, are real important skills once you graduate high school and you get onto the real world that your regular high school classes don't necessarily set you up to know how to do as much. But you're, you're working in teams over the course yes. of a semester or even a full school year to solve an existing real problem in the community for mm -hmm. a nonprofit, a governmental agency. Yep. Um, so uh, each project a, would a then have business. some sort of, okay. yeah, co like community partner with it, um, whether it's like government, yeah, business. Great. Chuck, do you want to add anything at this point before we travel to Virginia for a few minutes? Uh, yeah, I think a couple things. One is, um, yes, we did uh, start small and pretty, and also wanted to stay within uh, the, the Dunbar number of 150. Uh, so when we were gonna, when we looked like we were gonna go over 150 students, move to another location to keep the numbers in any one location within the uh, potential for authentic relationships. Um, and then the, there's two other things that struck me about Iowa Big. One is when the, child, when the children, when the students arrived and were asked to describe their passion, it was not easy for them. It took quite a bit of time, coaching, probing to, because that, that had never happened before. It was always, you know, tell me where the hoop is and I'll jump through it. Uh, so the idea of actually creating something that was in line with your authentic self was, was a new task. The other thing that I loved was we had a wide variety of students who would attend Iowa Big. We would have the A plus honor roll students and we'd have the D minus about ready to get kicked out of high school students. And once they were in Iowa Big, you couldn't tell the difference. Nobody walking in there could tell who was who. I love that part of the story. Yeah, and so, so many of the uh, students here in the class um, visited some of the websites here relevant to what we're talking about. And they spoke to that, the very issue of how their experience at high school was, you know, use the metaphor of, tell me how to hit the hoop. It had nothing to do with, you know, what interests you, what is your passion, what is your purpose? How do you want to find your purpose? What do you want to do with your life? How can you live a meaningful life? None of those things. You know, just follow, show up, follow the rules. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, and great. so again, to me, in that system, even the winners are losing. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Jenny, do you want to tell us about Springhouse? I do. I do, and I'd like to start by reading a poem. I'd like to start by reading a poem that um, is from, I hope, I, I hope my connection stays. I'm out here in the mountains. Um, am I still with you? Oh, good. good. Okay, this is a poem that I read often. It's from Terry Tempest Williams, and it really embodies why we exist at Springhouse. So I invite you to just, close your eyes or take it in, but they're beautiful words um, and important ones. The eyes of the future are looking back at us and they are praying for us to see beyond our own time. They are kneeling with hands clasped that we might act with restraint, that we might leave room for the life that is destined to come. To protect what is wild is to protect what is gentle. Perhaps the wilderness we fear is the pause between our own heartbeats. The silent space that says we live only by grace. Wilderness lives by this same grace. Wild mercy is in our hands. I'm reading it one more time because sometimes it takes a few times to sink in. 
The eyes of the future are looking back at us and they are praying for us to see beyond our own time. They are kneeling with hands clasped that we might act with restraint, that we might leave room for the life that is destined to come. To protect what is wild is to protect what is gentle. Perhaps the wilderness we fear is the pause between our own heartbeats, the silent space that says we live only by grace. Wilderness lives by this same grace. Wild mercy is in our hands. Terry Tempest Williams. Happy to be here, everybody. Gary, thanks for having me. Um, and really happy to be here with Iowa Big, um, who I met a long time ago. And, and um, I'm just really, really grateful to be in the same room with y'all. Um, <clears throat> so Springhouse, like I said, is located in Floyd, Virginia in the Blue Ridge, beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, and our vision is a mighty one. Our vision is to um, build regenerative culture. What does that mean? Regenerative culture is culture where we all are connected to the vitality within and around us, a life-giving culture. And <clears throat> how we walk toward that vision is through, with our, through our mission. And our mission is to create vitality-centered education, education that brings us alive, that doesn't put us to sleep, that connects us with the gift of our life. Well, how do we do that? Um, that's also pretty mighty. Um, we do that through, um, the best way to describe that in action is through our five design principles. And our design we call sourced design, and we share that design globally um, in small intimate cohorts. But the five design principles are, the first one is to take care of vul vulnerability, take care of vulnerability no matter what within and around us, um, cultivate personhood, and we do that by reclaiming a relationship with our bodies, which is desperately needed in education and just culturally at large, um, by fostering a sense of the sacred and by committing to a regular practice of self-study and inventory of self, self, staying connected to our self-awareness. The third principle is building beloved community and there's a lot of ways we do that. Um, but the community is the container through which we heal, which we serve, um, and which we learn in, um, beloved community. And the fourth principle is respecting the wisdom of the earth. So really learning from our greatest teacher, our oldest teacher about how to live together as human beings and with the earth and beyond. Um, and then the final principle is to love and serve others. We do all of this, we cultivate and take care of life to share it with others. So how do we do that at Springhouse? We do that through a seventh through 12th grade day school. Um, we do that through an adult program. We have something that we call depth courses where adults can get to know themselves more deeply because self-awareness is one of the most lacking competencies in our culture and we need to strengthen that. That's why we offer that for adults. We also offer a two-year program for adults that um, we offer a certificate in regenerative cultural design and practice. And then we also have the Source Design Network where we share these design principles with people around the world who want to cultivate vitality, who wanna put vitality at the front and center of their life, their community, could be their educational setting, but doesn't have to be. Um, one of the other unique things about Springhouse is that we have a generative economic model where we don't charge for any of our um, educational offerings. It's not, it, we don't want to make education a commodity to be bought and sold. So our generative economic model is rooted in trust, transparency, and relationship. So we ask people, um, we're fully transparent with our budget. And then we ask anyone who wants to be involved with Springhouse to contribute to the whole in any way that they can. And, um, and I'm happy to share how that's going this year. We're going into our ninth year as a school for, and our school is really for people who want to learn how to be regenerative culture builders, people who want to build life-giving culture. That's what it's there for. Um, so I'm happy to share how the economic model is going. We're learning a lot through the process. Um, let me see, the last thing I wanna say is, 
that for us is education is a way by which we can create culture. <laughs> oh God, so sorry. Um, the uh, education is a pathway to create culture, one that brings us alive. And for us, that starts with adults. So we have a heavy focus on um, ecocentric human development, starting with the staff. We want, we embody what we want to see in the world. We start by embodying what we hope for in our youth. We start with us. And that's really important to us. Um, and we know when we look at education at large, conventional educational settings, we know that the design is flawed. The design is flawed because at the center of it, it, do, it, it doesn't have taking care of the gift of life at the center. And so we're not super interested in doing a lot of symptom management, but more looking at the design or blaming, especially blaming our young people. I mean, it, that hurts our young people and the adults who are in that system. Um, so what we're interested in doing as far as design is really placing the source of life, the gift of life at the center of design. And that's with our curriculum, with our economics, with our assessment model, with everything. Um, so that's really what we're seeing as we go into our ninth year is very different than, than what we might see in a conventional setting. And happy to share more on that now, but I'll stop talking and see what Skylar wants to say. Thanks everybody for listening. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. <coughs> yeah, how that looks as a, as a student of Spring House. Um, it's the, the word that immediately comes to mind is love. Um, feeling like I have, um, people around me who love me in really deep ways. Um, and yeah, I, I think that that's, um, I think that's, what's most important. Um, because I, I, I feel that a lot of the, um, a lot of, a lot of problems in the world stem from a place of, um, lack of love. And, um, I think one of the number one ways to solve so many of the problems that exist today is to love people. And I think that is the biggest thing that's missing from um, the, the kind of the, the monoculture educational design today is this dehumanizing numbering and this extraordinarily um, strict um, and unloving world that, that kids grow up in. Um, and I think for me, um, being at Spring House, uh, I truly feel loved and I truly feel seen. Um, there has been so many times where I've, you know, been a teenager and done like really te total teenager things, you know, um, being arrogant, being a jerk, being whatever. And there's this, there's this layer of like, I'm not necessarily punished for that i'm not punished for that actually at all i'm seen and that to me has been much much more effective than um being expelled or suspended or um getting slaps on the wrists or whatever those are that that's what's really important to me um and that's what's that's, that's what's really coming up for me right now. So, yeah. Boy, thank you both. I um, I should have mentioned earlier. I was um, remiss in not mentioning that Chuck is really the common denominator between the two schools. Um, he's also on the board, the chair of the board of Springhouse. So Chuck, if you want to add anything to uh, what Skyler and Jenny have said, that'd be terrific at this point. Well, uh, only, I would say only link because I was involved in one and now I'm involved in the other, but I, I wasn't really, I mean, I was 
not involved at all in, in obviously starting Springhouse. Um, happy to be involved now. Um, but there's clearly, I mean, Springhouse is a uh, community day school, but it is, it is uh, investment funded. It's not part of a school district. Uh, Iowa Big uh, is not only part of a school district, it's a multi-school district uh, endeavor. Uh, so there's just a lot more uh, administration uh, at Iowa Big, a lot more freedom of movement at uh, at Springhouse. That's very evident. Also, Springhouse, you know, uh, is a the ages of um, you know more like twelve or thirteen to eighteen. So it's a longer time period. Um, most Iowa Big students are two year. A few are three year, but most are two year. And the other thing is that at Iowa Big, we started with thinking that we could cover every subject with this project-based learning. And it became quickly apparent that there are some subjects, uh, advanced math, some of the advanced sciences that really need a structured approach. So the students at Iowa Big are not full-time students. They're, they're doing a significant amount of their schoolwork through this project based learning, but are still going to more the more structured uh, science and math courses, particularly at their school. If I could build on that, yeah. it's always so great to hear <laughs> about other schools who are doing unique things. And I think what's the what the tie really to positive education is, is one, that the schools are different in many ways, but they both accomplish something really special. And we used to say this all the time at Iowa Big was bringing the public back into public education, um, really bringing the humanity back to what education is and can be, um, making it about who we want to become, um, what we want to see in the world and then becoming that ourselves. I think is a really beautiful commonality between the two schools. We have a student here in the class, um, Allison, would like to ask a question of Jenny and Skyler. So I was looking at the website um, for Springhouse and saw like one of the populations you guys serve is like the seventh to 12th graders. And my question was how so are these students choosing Springhouse over like a traditional school, um, K through 12 building and how, like how does that work for them or how does that look for them building up to like college or the differences between Springhouse and like a traditional school? Yes, thank you. Is, this is Allison. Yes. Okay, hi Allison. Um, yes, people, um, young people choose Springhouse. We are an independent accredited school in Virginia um, and we're private, we're a nonprofit. So um, students choose us. We have no public funding um, unless, we get a, unless we get a federal grant or something like we did through COVID. So um, Stu, your question really is, is your question like, how is it different? Then, or how do they, how does their day look or how do they structure their learning? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, in, as far as we're, you know, the, the learner is everyone in the school. <laughs> the learner is not just the teenager. So everyone is learning. Um, and so the learner isn't, I mean, is not necessarily at the center. Life is at the center. Life that, that in all its forms and taking care of the gift of life is at the center. And so everyone is learning, adults are learning, uh, teens are learning. It's very intergenerational and, and very um, not separated or segregated by, by age a lot of times. Um, it's, we also don't silo subjects. So we don't, we, don't have, we don't do like math and science and we might have like an elective, like I'm teaching an anatomy elective right now, but we're using art. We don't, but we generally, the whole curriculum is structured based on what the world needs. So um, there's different main courses that happen throughout the day. There's electives that happen throughout the day. There's um, 
we dance three times a week together. We sing twice a week together. They do small group mentoring. Every single student has a mentor um, that is is um, n- not just like um, n- not just like uh, overseeing. That's not the right word. They're um, academic project, but they're more like a soul friend that's walking with them throughout there. And Skylar can speak to what that relationship is like. Um, so there is definitely a structure to the day um, that has a lot of movement within it. And, and our hope is, and we hope to get stronger, um, is that the whole curriculum itself is in response to the needs of the world. Because that's the second part of our mission is we create vitality-centered education to respond more courageously to what the world needs. So any, if you were to visit Springhouse, and Chuck could speak to this too, we also have H. Um, Leopold on here, who's our Vitality Centered Education Lead. We have another board member on here, Paul, um, who's Chuck, he's here. Um, so you all could speak to this too, but um, it's really, um, there is definitely a structure to the day that students kind of move within. And as students develop and get older, they need less external structure to support them. So they have a lot more freedom, um, but that's different for every student as they get older. And I don't know, maybe H, do you wanna say anything about this? Cause H, so a lot of the, the everything is pretty much emergent from Springhouse. Our, our paradigm, our curriculum, our assessment model, everything has emerged over the course of nine years at Springhouse. So it's very, very different. And anytime a family or a student moves towards us, we have many, many conversations (laughs) about how different it is because if people expect anything to be really what they're used to, it it can cause a lot of anxiety and problems down the road. Um, H, do you wanna say anything? Are you there? H was cooking dinner, so I'm not sure. Oh, here's H, okay. I'm here, but I'm also wondering if Allison has, like if that answered your question or if you have additional questions or curiosities about what Jenny's saying? Yeah, Jenny did a great job. My like second part to that question would be, so like, how does the like, I guess in traditional school, you have your graduation, you get your diploma, your next step is college. Are most of these students looking to go to college? And if so, like, can they receive their diploma from Springhouse to get into college? Kind of like compared to traditional school. Yep. Yeah, so everyone leaves with a diploma um, and they also leave with a transcript for part of the Mastery Transcript Consortium. And so they offer a gradeless transcript that we use um, because we don't offer grades. Um, And yeah, we have some learners that go off to college, some go straight into some kind of work-related thing. They might travel. Um, Really what we're interested in though is that when people leave Springhouse, they have a sense of themselves and they have a sense of their immediate next step. That might be college, but that might be something completely different. And college might be five, 10 years down the road, or it might be never. And we're not a college prep school. So we're not kind of, that's not our our goal is like, you need to all get into college. Um, But we do support people that 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 is their next step. Um, And they can with our transcript and um, yeah. Awesome, yeah, no, that, that helps a lot. Thank you. You're Thanks, welcome. Allison. Thanks for the question. Yeah, Thanks, of course. Abe. Great to learn more. Uh, Chris, I see your message here. Are you with us, Chris? I am. Yeah, go ahead and turn your camera on. That's perfectly fine. Okay. There we go. All right. There. Hey. And and I I know you well enough to know that you probably have about seven questions oh, right now, right? Yes, I do. Should I just start okay. with one? I'll okay. just start with go one. Go ahead. Go ahead. So this is going to Chuck. Um, Chuck, I you know, and we I have a forty two year old autistic daughter who had a had a question or something to tell me right when you were doing your intro. So you might have covered this, and so sorry about that, but um. You know, I know because I know I'm older than Gary, so <laughs> I'm probably older than you. This is Walmart. Um, but anyway, I, uh, I'm i thinking about 
I have a hunch that you understand some of the beginnings of my educational experience in that 60s, you know, time frame. And, um, and I look at what you are able, to, because of your passion to create these offerings, um, I'm thinking about if this had been a different time and this had been offered to you, what would been have your what would have been your trajectory? Who do you think you might have become? Gosh, what a question! I know. Uh, <laughs> um, um, all I can say that I the lesson I learned in my education, which was in the '60s, was there is a right answer. Mm. And the person who gets it fastest is best, mm. which did mm. not serve me well in general. So I'm thinking that if I had been more in a project-based, more collaborative atmosphere, um, I might have seen more of the mystery of reality. Uh, Reality was pretty chopped up and boring to me, given the, the framework in which it was presented to me. Yeah. And I'm, um, yeah, I mean, I, yes. And one of, one, of the, one of the things I spend a lot of time on is um, developing students' ability to read while maintaining their wholeness and agency. Yeah. Yes, yes. And a key part of that is acknowledging the complexity and mystery of that, uh, that thing, which many of us think is automatic now, yeah. uh, but it's absolutely astounding. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. And when you're thwarted as a young one, then you don't know. It's like that the the flea that doesn't jump out of the jar if it has a cover on and soon learns that it doesn't need to jump out. It can't jump right. out, and then it won't jump out. Right. Well, and I mean, I you just can't believe how many people tell me they never understood the basics of what was going on with reading. Mm. Meaning, you know, like. For example, we've been, we've been using oral language for a long, long time, right? Hundreds of thousands of years, probably. We don't know for sure. But we've only been reading for like 5,000 years. And the first 2,000 of those was, you owe me a bushel of corn. You know? <laughs> so this is a very recent, recent experience. So let's like, you know, let's like lighten up a little bit here. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, you know, Gary knows that my research for my PhD was in the area of resiliency. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think about what this, the con, you know, the world is struggling with right now as far as rebounding back from some of the tragedies and, and the fallout from the things that we've gone through. And you talk about agency, the ability to solve problems, the ability to participate and contribute, and you're building that into both of these programs, and that will make people resilient. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And feel free to come back for more. Yes, yeah. I'll more keep questions. my video on. No, but my Please do. On. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else um, on Zoom who would like to ask a question or make a comment, jump in. Um, make sure we have pulled everyone. Resiliency is one of the Springhouse six core values. If not, I, I would like Skylar to uh, talk a bit more. Um, if you could about uh, your experience there as a student, you know, you, you gave us um, a beautiful I think, testimonial for um, Springhouse and what it's done for you. But can you talk some about some of the um, some of the nuts and bolts activities that you've been involved in and what you've um, how you've grown as a result of those? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think. Uh, I think initially just want to recognize, like, I, I always feel tension doing stuff like this because I'm always like, how do I capture this in its fullness in, in, you know, an hour and a half? Um, something that's impacted me so intense, so like intensely in my last, 
you know, uh, eight years of my life. Um, so I, I think um, initially, like, kind of like to, to answer, um, oh, I, f I forget, I forget uh, their name, but uh, the, the question that was given to Jenny um, uh, about a cl like class times and, or, or how that kind of works and how that structure works. Um, one thing that immediately comes to me is a class that had uh, impacts on me heavily was uh, a class about addiction. Um, and this kind of like this class kind of paints the picture for me of, of how um, Springhouse does classes. Um, this what we focused heavily on addiction and the ways that we went through that is to look at statistics how statistics can be used to lie about what addiction means the opioid crisis and all that um how to how to empathize with people because it's a really intense um you know problem in the world and there's a lot of people who struggle with it um and uh also looking at science how do we test our our, our uh uh, yeah, how do we how do we test our hypothesis um, uh, around, you know, uh, addiction and, and all of that. And so um, that course is really was really kind of painted a picture for me about, um, you know, the kind of model that isn't siloed subjects and how we kind of focus on a big topic and we find ways in that topic to focus on um, really useful skills. Um, and so I think one, one really important thing, um, that I've learned at Springhouse and, and one of the biggest ways that I think, um, makes Springhouse unique is the balance around, um, structure and emergence and, um, that kind of, um, airy type of stuff. Um, it's, I, I, I've noticed, you know, uh, you know, I've, I've seen, I've been to, I, I visited schools. I've, I've done, uh, I've, I've seen all types of education models. And a, a lot of things that I notice is it's, is that there's often schools that are super structured, like, um, uh, like the public education system in a lot of ways, um, that kind of like, it, it totally like restrains people from actually being able to be themselves. Um, and so, uh, I feel like Springhouse um, uh, really hits this balance um, of kind of bringing in this kind of airy, um, really loving uh, space for emergence and also allowing for structure. Um, yeah, and I think I think you know ex examples of that uh, come through every single day. Um, yeah, does that does that answer? Does that answer your question there no 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 that's that's terrific skylar i mean you a, a high school course on addiction or addictions i mean that's got to be unusual um if you look at traditional high schools across the country where did the course and this may be a question more for um for jenny where did the course uh come from what was the inspiration for that i know you're you're constantly attempting to be attuned to what's happening in the world and um, mm -hmm. tying into things and letting that, you know, your, uh, what happens emerge, you know, mm -hmm. from those needs. So when and where, and how did something like a course on addictions evolve? Right. So thanks Gary. So H and all of us have really been developing this um, curricular model over the past nine years. So the curricular model obviously is put in place to, um, well, its purpose is to create people who care and can't, who care about life-giving culture and can help create it. That's the whole reason for the school. So the curriculum itself orients around three um, areas of exploration. And that's, they're very broad to start with, the earth, the body or the human being and culture or society. So everything that we teach is within that model and then I'm not going to get all into it, but then there's intersections that really are where 
Um, yeah, I'm not even going to get into it. It's too much right now. If people are interested, you can email me at jenny at springhouse.org. <laughs> so there's a whole curricular model that we've created. Um, and within that, we also have a competency or skills framework. So the skills needed to be a regenerative culture builder. It's like what you need to know and how you need to be. So, um, so within that model, um, as a staff and students, Skylar, like H has said here, Skylar has facilitated two electives at the school. Within our model, we, we, we see what the world needs and also what inspires us. Like anatomy really inspires me. That's why I'm teaching it. And that I want to learn more about anatomy. So I'm teaching it. And it's also in relationship to knowing our bodies better because I know that empowers us. It grounds us. So that's one of the reasons I'm teaching that. The addiction course came out of one of our staff members, Chris Wolf. He was interested in studying it. And at the time, I don't know how many of you have heard of the book Dope Sick by Beth Macy. There was just a um, Hulu series that was made, uh, created a, a, from the book. Um, and it's powerful. If you haven't read it or seen it's very troubling, but it's about the opioid crisis. And so Beth Macy is from our area. She's from Roanoke. And, and um, we actually know her through Skylar's parents. So we connected with Beth Macy. We got the book Dope Sick. We read it. They read it as a class. We had Beth Macy come um, to Floyd and she talked with us. Um, we had a whole community event around addiction. So what inspired us is it came from a staff member and a local author who was highlighting the local problem and now national, unfortunately, um, problem of opioid addiction. And then that, with all of that within our, our framework, the course was created. So staff are co constantly creating emergent curriculum for all of these classes. I mean, H, I'm thinking about all the classes that we've taught, like we could put together a massive, <laughs> a massive book on all of these different curriculums related to in different syllabi and things related to what it means to be a regenerative culture and how a culture builder and how that connects to the needs of the world. So that's, you know, within, within a framework, Gary, it, it's born from, but it's also born from the passion of the people who are learning within it. Yeah. So can I, I have to tell you that the way I learn is through stories. And when Skylar started, he talked about love and then you talk about structure and, and he talked about that balance on, with structure and the emergence. And it, the story that comes to my mind was, you know, and our, our 40 year old son was just a little toddler. He had ear infections so much he had to have tubes in his ears. Well, they, they left a perforation, a little hole in his eardrum. And so they had to go in and patch it. And what they did, the, the doc said that they went in, they took a little instrument, they had to scratch on the eardrum, rough it up a little bit. And then they took a piece of fat from behind the earlobe and put it over that hole. And the purpose was the scratching was set so that fat would adhere to the eardrum and build a scaffolding to make a patch. And so I think about the, you know, we talk about the kids that need this kind of environment. They're wounded sometimes because they don't find it where their normal life is. And so they're roughed up already. And you bring in this love and then the scaffolds, that structure helps scaffold and you build up and ah, there's my metaphor. Just had to tell you. Thank you, Chris. Wow. Um, you, you, pro, you, pro, you provided me with a um, perfect segue for something I do want to ask about. And um, the students in the class here are very familiar with the concept that we is central to positive psychology. And we've been talking about the last couple of weeks in the class, and that's this concept called flow that was given that name by Mihai Cheeks and Mihai. And um, I have a question for Hannah and for Skylar. Can you contrast what life was like in the traditional school versus, you know, the learner-centered education experience, um, where in the traditional school, from what you're telling me, I'm inferring that there wasn't a lot of creativity, there wasn't a lot of engagement in something that you loved for its own sake at a high level of challenge where you could lose yourself in the experience where self-consciousness would disappear or the ego would fall aside, um, where time would become distorted and all of the other components 
dimensions that we know are true of this experience of flow. Um, can you contrast those two worlds for us, traditional school versus what that experience was like? Because I'm presuming it was there, you know, in spades in um, Iowa at Iowa Big and um, Springhouse. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anna, I can you give that first. a shot? Okay. Um, I can kind of just share. So I would say in traditional high school, I wasn't necessarily one of those students who like was obviously struggling or anything like that you know I mean my I got good grades I was involved I checked the boxes you know that they needed me to check in order to like fall off the radar almost and I also found that a lot of times when I would try to express my creativity whether it was through like trying to start a club or trying to plan an event or even just like connect community with school, I found there were a lot of barriers, a lot of barriers. Um, you need to get this approved by so-and-so, or you need a staff, whatchamacallit, to support your whatever, things like that. Um, and it was very frustrating. Um, and I felt very confined into who I had to be. You know, I but there wasn't a lot of space for me to explore who I wanted to be. Um, but then I started Iowa Big and that like totally flipped. Um, I would I would place most of that just on the connection that exists there, um, the relationships that exist there. Skylar kind of denoted how he feels so loved in his learning environment. I mean, I, I think we definitely had that community at Iowa Big too. Um, all of my teachers, I felt genuinely cared about my direction and my ability to reflect on myself, my actions, what I wanted for myself, what my future was going to look like, um, and in authentic ways. So it was like a complete 180. <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot of that's similar for me. Um, though, though I only, I only went to uh, a traditional school for like elementary time. Oh. And a little bit of middle school, so I didn't quite get like that high school experience. But um, a big thing that I um, realized is that, oh my gosh, this can be done differently. Um, and and just and and just kind of being in awe of like uh, what's possible and what I can spend seven eight hours of my day doing instead of you know sitting in in fluorescently lit rooms and and hearing people talk and talk at me for the entire day um you know i i think the big thing is is around empowerment was was really what what came what what i'm thinking of when i think about the differences that i felt um you know now now in my time at springhouse you know I, i've led you know, like, like, like H and Jenny said, I've led two courses about things that I genuinely care about. Um, you know, I have, I have a mentor, um, that I really connect with. That's like, um, someone that I truly look up to and somebody that I have like a mutual relationship with, um, where it's like, I look up to them and they also look up to me at times. And it's like this kind of like really interesting dynamic um and so and, and that was something that was totally missing from my from my you know traditional growing up education um where it was kind of like look at this person who um you know uh is is reading me stuff from a textbook um you know that's that's it's really um beautiful and it's also like i have power and i mean that like i have this power to shift culture and culture in this in this uh in the school and and uh have relationships that really make deep impacts um and yeah that's those are some things that i uh yeah and, and yeah and my and uh my mentor is somebody that i'm going to be working with as a um someone that I'm going to be working with after I graduate on a whole other space that's going to be under kind of the the umbrella of Springhouse is going to be a space for experience and art. 
Um, and so I'm super excited about that. And I, and, you know, that reminds me of like all the leadership positions that I've been able to be in. I, I work with Jenny in, in defining and working with the vision and how, uh, that meets, um, you know, kind of like the vision and the mission, how that, uh, comes through. Um, there's a lot of really beautiful things that I've gotten to experience. I don't think I would have if I stayed in my traditional, um, schooling environment. How many of us thinking back to our days in high school can describe an experience, anything even close, even remotely close to uh, what Skylar has. I mean, that's, and, and Hannah too, I mean, just amazing. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge here, and uh, if she'd like to speak, she certainly is um, encouraged to do so. Um, Deb, you had a, a comment a few minutes ago. As a Springhouse okay. parent, I can say that as my offspring has grown, so have I. Uh, this beloved community is absolute gold. I want to turn your, there we go. If you'd like to add to that, Deb, feel free. Go ahead and do so, please. Um, yeah, this community has been a, <clears throat> a huge turning point for my offspring. Felix is a senior this year, same age as Skylar, um, but they have only um, had three years at Springhouse. Um, and those three years have been a time of exponential growth for Felix because they have, as Skylar said, felt completely loved and seen um, and allowed to be who they truly are. Um, I have recently started to engage <clears throat> more with the Springhouse community because Felix got their license. And so I was no longer just automatically inserted into the community in mornings and afternoons at pick up and drop off. I now have to actually cultivate my um, connection with this beloved community. And it has really helped me to see how much work it is um, and how much good work it is to cultivate that. Um, yeah, Felix has is on the spectrum um, and has been as I've said, just growing so much. Uh, Felix actually got to um, co-facilitate a course last year on astrophysics. Um, previously, um, Felix had been completely freaked out by math. Uh, the public school experience had ruined them on loving math, but they were really good at it but it was really freaky and hard uh, because of how it was presented. Um, and then last year, Felix gets this idea, oh my God, astrophysics would be really cool to learn. Can we have a course on that? So Felix got the opportunity to co-facilitate it. And it was super fantastic. Talk about embodied learning. They, um, they figured out what it would take to uh, launch everyone at Springhouse to Mars. Um, is how they <laughs> worked through their astrophysics. They worked on gravity, different gravities on different planets, thrust, um, what everyone would take. <laughs> you had 40 pounds, right? 40 pounds of stuff you could take. Um, and so they all had to figure out what they would take with them. Um, it was really fantastic. Um, that's, really, that's really all I need to say, I guess. <laughs> No, thank you. That's a, that's a great um, illustration of the, uh, the sense of emergence that's so central to um, what happens at Springhouse. I mean, another question, thinking back, how many of us in high school, when we were in high school, would say that the concept of vitality, which is at the center of Springhouse, was in any way, certainly not embraced, but even considered, even peripherally, within the high school vitality. I mean, what an alien, you know, sadly alien concept, you know, for probably all of us when we were at traditional high school. I, I, I wanna call attention real quickly here to a comment that H made and then Jenny followed up on. Um, H's comment you might see in the, uh, the chat about love. Uh, love. Love is not always soft, often it is asking the hard question, 
or setting a boundary. And then Jenny, you followed up on that with um, an MLK quote. Um, if either or both of you would like to uh, say a little more about that, that'd be terrific. Um, well, Thanks. yeah, uh, I'm thinking about Skyler. Okay. <laughs> and Skyler, I've known since he was nine. Um, and Skyler, you know what this quote means from a, from a teenager's perspective. Um, I mean, can you give an example of what you could talk about it in even our relationship? You know, I've been, I'm not his formal mentor at Springhouse, but I do, he does apprentice with me around visionary work. So what's an example of, of, of what this love has looked like in our mentoring relationship? And if you, before you do, Kyle or Skylar, um, for those who can't see this in the classroom, they might not be able to see it up on the screen. The MLK quote uh, that Jenny provides is, power without love is reckless and abusive. Love without power is sentimental and anemic. Mm -hmm. It's all yours, Skylar. <laughs> Good luck, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. Let me sit with it for a second. Um, I remember a situation, um, where I was feeling some tension in my relationship with another, um, student at the school. And, um, I remember going to Jenny and being like, um, kind of just like from an emotional state, like being like, I hate this guy, ah, you know? Um, and I, I remember kind of being like, so like with this beloved community thing, how do I do it? <laughs> and I just remember this, this like thing, this like Jenny just caught on fire, not like in like a bad way. She just like the passion, like doom. And she was like, it is, she was like, um, beloved community is one of the hardest things you will ever have to move through or have to work with in your life. And I just, I just remember it was like, it was such a roast in the most loving, like she just roasted me. And I re I remember um, just like, that's a perfect example where it wasn't just like, oh, Skylar, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're so right, you know? Um, and it also wasn't like, blah, blah, you know, like really angry um, meanness. It was this like really passionate, like, centered um like boundaries and like remembering that like yeah it's just like this 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 love that isn't always fun <laughs> that isn't always games that isn't always like you know up in the air um and is um deeply rooted and grounded and um also very humbling so that was great, Thanks, <laughs> Skylar. It it sounds like um, Deb. Deb, do you have a quick example? Deb just messaged me and said she has an example. I'm sorry, Deb does. Yeah, I do. Quick one. Um, when when I was uh, when Felix was thinking of coming to the school, Jenny sat me down and looked me directly in the eyes and said, "Sometimes." it's gonna get tough. Are you gonna hold the line when it gets tough? Are you gonna do the easy thing? Or are you gonna do the hard thing and hold the line and do what we really need to have happen for Felix to thrive? 
And I said, oh, yes. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> Thanks, Deb. Yeah, and just to give people context real quick, Gary, is that for us, like everybody on the team at Springhouse, is not there to be just a teacher in a school. Not that there's anything wrong with being a teacher in a school. I mean, God bless. That's the hard, honestly the hardest work that can be done. Um, but it's more for us about culture change. So we're we're accessing education as a pathway to be to to create culture that is life giving. We want to be a micro example of that. To, and we do already do this as a micro example, giving hope to other people. Not that we're perfect, not, a, not that it's utopia. It's just an example of what happens when a community does the crazy thing of, of really doubling down on life and love in community and, and creating everything around it to support that, that end. And we, re we really want our young people to and us as adults to to grow up and grow into healthy adulthood not we don't want them to we don't want to fix them or change them or expect them to fix all the problems that we've created it's more how do we all just tap in to what brings us alive not makes us happy but brings us alive and live from it and and that that is the day in day out daily rigorous routine happening that you have to be able to navigate and go through difficulty. It's just part of, part of the thing. You know, Jenny, I love that quote so much. And I put it in my journal just now. Um, you know, and I think about what is a great example and right away to the front of our minds is the difference between Putin and Vlad Vladimir Zelensky. You know, the power without love is reckless and abusive. The power, love with power is sentimental and anemic. And we're not seeing that in, we're seeing love with power, I mean, in, in the Ukraine. And so I just think that's a great, you know, um, just a just exposition or whatever, how you say that. But I'm thinking about as instructors, sometimes, you know, a student, and it goes back to Chuck saying agency, Sometimes if we can empower, there's Skylar's word, empower the students to say to the instructor what they need. You know, my dad said, always assign people value. And so if a, a student can say to a, uh, an instructor that said, nope, this is the way it is, and it's going to be this way, no matter what, I, that's power without love. But if an instructor said, but I know I can do, I need this from you to value me, and then use their agency to make a difference in their learning. Teach the teacher. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And, and you know, the interesting thing, I was typing it out here, but I'll just say it. We don't even use the words like, and, and this is just the truth. Um, and Skylar in H, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but like instructor or teacher, or mm -hmm. it's maybe facilitator. Um, but I, I can't stress enough, you kind of have to be there to see it, that we really are in this together mm -hmm. and that we respect where each other is on the developmental wheel, so to speak. So like I hold different wisdom because of my experience that's respected. And I know that Skylar holds wisdom from his experience mm -hmm. that I need in order for us to be whole. So like nobody is above anybody else, but we are respectful of where each other sits in the community. And we wanna, we wanna like harness that to rise to our highest yeah. potential. So it's like just a whole different way of even creating the system yeah. that is very hard to explain, honestly. It, it's very hard in, in panels like this and we're on many panels and podcasts it's hard to explain exactly what it is. And it is one of those things that to be there is, is, is a, again, not utopia, not perfect. It's just different. Yeah. You know, I said, I think Chuck said that too. When you get into Iowa big, all of a sudden there's no, but no, there's no one above the other, just like you said, Jenny. Right. And I'm a, I'm an EMS person. I've, I've worked with EMS forever. And I know that when you're in and works of ambulance people, especially volunteers, you find people with different levels of education and in a group of people, you know, who has more education than other. But when you share pain together, when you do kneel by each other, doing CPR on the same person, you're, you are sharing pain together 
you are the same. And it's just kind of like you said, when you're learning together, you're, you're the same. I hate to do it, but I'm going to have to follow that with a very pedestrian question. Jenny, how many students do you have and what's the student to teacher ratio? <laughs> um, we have, we have, I think 35 right now students. Stu students, okay. And yeah, we have 35 um, students, uh, teenagers. We have eight staff. We have many, many adult, uh, adult learners. And then over a hundred people have in the past two years have participated in our, in our design work from over 10 countries. Um, so that's where we're at right now, headed into our ninth year. And I can just tell anyone who's listening that that in and of itself is an incredible miracle <laughs> that we are in rural Appalachia, a private school, really scrappy, born from the earth here. <laughs> and just, we, we just keep orienting around life and keep going. And there, and it, there is no tuition. The students pay no, do not pay tuition. Or, or the adults. Or the adults. No, or the adults, even in a two-year program for adults. So, so, no, so but they contribute. But right. they contribute. So, okay, so your your funding sources are primarily well, global a, generous people, corporations. No, 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 no. There, it's a. <laughs> It's yeah, a diverse people go, with big go, hearts. Chuck, you go. Uh, no, no, no. Don't, don't get hung up on the word tuition. Okay. There yeah. is no tuition. Right. But as Jenny was saying, we're transparent with our budget and we say this is how much it costs. What can you contribute? And That's right. People, and so people yeah. self select. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's a global diverse network. Our funding is very diversified global diverse network from people around the world. Some people who have never even been to Springhouse give to Springhouse because they want the example to be there. They want an example that is, is truly emergent to be there. So they give to it and then we write grants. Um, we're not corporate funded. Um, so we write grants and then I forgot what the other one was. Fundraising, we do, we do pretty big fundraisers. Um, but everybody who goes there contributes because they want Springhouse to exist. So some people contribute $200 or nothing. Some people contribute 10 grand, it, it, anywhere in between. So it's just, what can a person give? But everybody, for Springhouse to exist, it needs money. It needs people. It needs physical resources. We're on an 11 acre farm, by the way. And that was given to us as a gift. And um, prayers and mindful attention, like just, send good energy our way and that helps us. I have a request of Chuck, but before I ask, I'd like anyone else either in the room here or on Zoom who would like to ask a question or comment, make a comment. It's not like this is your last opportunity. There's still a few more minutes, so you can hang on to that thought if you like. So, uh, seeing that there are none, uh, Chuck, many, I, a few, I should say, uh, are probably have some awareness of this, but you're keenly aware of it. So I'd like you to give us just a real quick history lesson here on the evolution of the American school system. Why traditional <laughs> schools look the way and feel the way they do and why that construct is one that, you know, Iowa Big and um, Spring House are so very, very different from. Where did this come from? Oh, good. What a you, question. You, you can give us a thumbnail. The only reason I can give a thumbnail is because of, you know, people like Trace Pickering and Jenny Finn and Tyson Yunkaporta and people like that who have explained all this. But, uh, you know, public education was not, not a big deal in the 1800s. And then with uh, the rise of uh, immigration and the movement from agriculture to industry, 
um, people said, well, we got we to do something. And they, they uh, looked to the longest running system of public education, which was in Europe, uh, in Prussia. And Prussia developed their system because they lost a battle to Napoleon. And they said to themselves, why did we lose the battle? Because our young men would not obey orders to the death. So let's create a system that will get people to be compliant. And if we get soldiers who will obey orders to their death, we'll also get compliant civil servants, we'll get compliant factory workers, and we'll become an industrial superpower and win the next battle. So they designed the system to focus on external motivation, to have bells interrupting the day constantly so that you can't um, focus for any length of time on anything. And uh, it worked. They became an industrial superpower and won the next battle. So people looked to them and said, oh, this is modern education. And we're trying to solve the problem of, of getting people to be common citizens in America. Uh, this was all around late 1800s, early 1900s. And we have the issue of uh, moving from the farm to the factory. And we got to get people ready to be good factory workers and good office workers and not be self-directed on the farm. So as one of my educational friends said, a former dean of the College of Education, the system is designed to do exactly what it does. The problem is it did it so well that when we needed to adapt, we could not adapt. Because everybody went to the same school and we all think we're fine. Basically. And here we are. Right. And fortunately, there are a few lone, almost lone, um, bold voices like Iowa Big and um, Springhouse that, that know otherwise, and, and students with you know great, great experiences that um, tell remarkable stories that um, tell us otherwise. Questions from students here in the class? Anybody? Any of you guys want to come up? Hunter, you look like you want to. Oh, there we go. All right, good. We do, we do have a student coming up. Um, any, anybody? Okay. Any, anybody uh, online, though, on Zoom, who would like to ask or question or comment on anything? All right. Thank you. Hello. So I kind of want to not hone in on anything in particular. I just kind of want to make a statement and open up a broader question, partially for Hannah and Skylar in particular, and then there'll also be one kind of for, for Chuck and Jenny. Um, and it's that there was a really short and powerful conversation going on here in the chat log about love. And I think a lot of people think of love as this um, sort of romantic companionship that we are supposed to yearn for and not a sort of interconnected love um, that kind of bridges the human experience. And so what about reinforcing that love do you feel makes it easier to like foster these types of communities? And also um, I just feel like, I guess I'll use this as an example, I was having Easter dinner with my girlfriend's family and I got myself into just a tiny bit of hot water telling her younger brother who's about to graduate high school that he does not have to go to college and that he just has to do something. Um, and uh, her family did not really take kindly to that necessarily. And I guess for me and what I see here and what was otherwise taught as something that's just completely antithetical to everything we're learning is all about authenticity. Like everything about this although maybe for people on the outside looking in, people who grew up in traditional education, people who've just grew up in Western society for the last four or five, six decades are going to view this as inauthentic um, in maybe some capacity. And so like, what do you guys feel? And this is more for, for Chuck and Jenny in particular, like what do you guys feel is the biggest challenge about remaining and 
kind of really reinforcing like this authenticity, this authenticity that's really important um, to this community and to these programs that also help you to be transparent and honest and, and everything else. I, I imagine that tackling that and being viewed as an authentic entity would make it easier to scale up. Um, but, but I don't know, I mean, what are the biggest challenges of scaling this up even? It's not something that probably only something can maybe Chuck and Jenny can answer. I don't even know. Is well, Hunter, I mean, yes. Yay, Hunter. So exciting. I just love what you're saying. Yes, yes, and yes. The kind of love you're describing Martin Luther Jun King Jr. would call agape love. It's not filial love, um, you know, ro er eros. It's agape love. It's a responsibility. It's an action. It's an inclusive, we are all in this together, whether we like it or not, move. <laughs> um, so um, I think uh, I'm not really worried about scaling. I know that when you go deep, something grows. So this is what I learned from the earth. You take care of the soil, you take care, you, you invite death, you water your plant, literally and metaphorically and it will grow and then you take care of it just like in my garden when the tomato gets big i take out a cage and i put it on it to help it grow it's the same thing and so um now is our is our design work grows around you know the world in small intimate ways um now i'm i'm realizing the complexity is beyond anything that i can just do myself and so i've just gathered five people around me who are in the network and i say help me help me build a metaphorical cage around this tomato plant because it's gotten too big for it to stand on its own or with just me. Um, so I don't really worry. I think we live in a culture where more is better and I don't subscribe to that. Um, and so I know that it will grow naturally and that I just hope that we're all in this community centered enough that we can notice it and take care of it and be creative with it as it grows. Um, and I will lastly say, and then hand it to Chuck, that um, the thing about this co the college admissions mania, um, which is comes from, um, what's his name, who writes for the New York Times, I can't remember his name, um, Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be, he wrote that book, David Brooks. Um, it, it, it is absolute madness, what we're doing with this college stuff. I mean, I just, we're, we're selling it to young people. Like it's a key to, I don't even know what, I, I have no idea what. And um, it's a shame because we're basically disempowering them while we do it. And, um, and it's a lot of adults who are doing that. And so I think it would really do, that's why we offer adult programming. So adults can really reclaim their own power and we don't have to like vicariously live through our kids and have them do things that we haven't done that we can actually just, really as adults reclaim our own lives and live them and, and kind of get off our kids, <laughs> get off our kids and let them grow up in ways that are healthy for them. That might include college, it might include other things, but college is absolutely not what we're making it out to be. And I'm someone who, you know, and I have faced, I've faced exactly what you faced at the Easter table, exactly, but at a, a larger level where it's like, oh, Jenny Finn doesn't want anyone to go to college. I have my PhD for God's sake, but it was great getting my PhD at Prescott College. It was transformative, I loved it. But what I'm saying is, is that it's not that I'm opposed to college, but I know that the answer isn't out here. The answer, the answer's in here and then we live it and then we are supported. You know, we, we find our path on the outside. So um, thank you for bringing that up. I really appreciate that, Hunter. Oh, how can I follow that? Nope. Yeah. Well, okay. First, I just want to say, <laughs> Hunter, that was a, that was a great question. Uh, you really you hit the nail on the head, and we have, uh, in my view, very warped. We have very warped views of love. Yeah. And Chuck, I have to follow this up with Hunter. <laughs> Hunter. I iPad at Best Buy. He sold us an iPad at Best Buy Saturday for our daughter. That's true. He is what? a brilliant thinker. And after that, I was listening to a psychologist on a po podcast talking about bottom rung thinkers and high top rung thinkers. And we thought of 
Hunter, he's a top run thinker. Wow. You and he. And guess what he wants uh, to be, what? but he has to go to college for it. School. I don't know if he wants. Oh, no, no, no I counselor. Say, that's I, what I, I teach. Guidance counseling, which is yeah, that's what I teach. What, what we connected on when I sold for the iPad. Oh, so. yeah, it was great. That was awesome. Yeah. This is just well, ah. there, there. There is a terrific, and I'll, I'll make it available for the class, and I can send it to the rest of you. A just a remarkably good video. It's it's a, it's a voiceover by um, um, Alan Watts. Is a 60s counterculture British philosopher. I'm just really, really good. And um, I think it is, what would you do? If you could do anything you, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it exactly right, but essentially what would you do with your life if you could do anything you wanted? You know, um, what would you become if you didn't have to conform to all of these, you know, constraints that are telling you that you need to do, you know, what, they think you need to do. And it's it's really, really good. So I'll, I'll share that so you guys can see that. Alan Watts in general is just remarkably good, I think. So, wow. Um, I don't know if we can top that, but if anybody would like to add anything else, not attempting to top anything, but anybody else would like to add something, please feel free on Zoom. I just want to thank Anna? everybody who ignore the dog toy squeaking in the background, but I just want to thank everybody who just brought their insight and really brought their authenticity to this. I mean, I'm in week 14 of student teaching right now in all traditional schools, and it can be so soul draining sometimes, but to hear all of you speak about your beautiful experiences in education um, is just, it's inspiring. So thank you. <laughs> um, Hunter, do you have anything else to sell? To Chris, I think is an eager, uh, consumer here she's ready oh, i'll buy anything, anything at all. from hunter <laughs> you, <laughs> okay. you got me around your little finger hunter <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay any closing comments chuck uh jenny skyler um yeah just just want to say thank you to all of y'all uh, I really, really appreciate um, the chance to speak and to share. Um, it, I'm, I, it's also just like it's deeply inspiring to me that know that there's um, people interested in learning about this. Um, so thank you a lot. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for having us. It was such a pleasure. It was great to see you, Hannah, and um, good to see you, Chuck. And just thank you for the questions. And um, if anyone wants to learn more about Springhouse, reach out. We have visitors all the time. Happy to receive you here in the beautiful Blue Ridge. Thanks, everybody. And thanks, Gary. Yeah. No, no. Thank you, all of you. And there, there, there are a number of schools, different types of schools out there. Iowa Big and Springhouse are not the only incarnations that are doing amazing things that are just intuitively applying the principles of you know, positive psychology and doing remarkable things by giving people authentic opportunities for authentic experiences in pre a prepared environment and just letting them be themselves and achieve, you know, challenging goals and let, letting remarkable things happen. So um, it's all really pretty simple. You know, it's, um, it's all, all of the layers of, of education and bureaucracy over the last you know, number of decades that have made it you know, so difficult and so um, challenging for in the wrong way for students to uh, be successful and have a good experience and um, emerge from high school really feeling strong and vital. So thank you, all of you. All right, this has been recorded, so we'll make it available to everyone. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you Thanks. all. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Good night. Thank you, Bye. thank you. Bye, everyone.